Recently, Derek at Veritasium, which is an excellent channel that everyone should subscribe to, by the way, posted a video describing a thought experiment involving a light bulb that generated a lot of discussion online amongst physicists. The link to that video is in the description, and you should probably watch that first. In this video, I want to discuss one important detail that Derek and many of his supporters here on YouTube consistently overlook. First, and before I get into what the thought experiment is, I should mention this is not my field. I'm formerly an astrophysicist, currently a nuclear physicist, and so I might be overlooking something myself, but I think I remember enough of the pain I experienced taking Jackson e &M to feel pretty confident that a lot of people are looking at this problem the wrong way. Okay, so with all the caveats out of the way, let's get to the thought experiment. Suppose you have a battery with a switch connected to an extremely long circuit. So long, in fact, that the light travel time around the entire DC circuit from the negative end of the battery to the positive end is two full seconds. But the distance between the parallel portions of this circuit is only one meter, so the light travel time between these parallel lines of wire is roughly 10 to the minus 9 seconds. Now suppose we place a bulb directly opposite the battery. When we close the switch, how long does it take for the bulb to turn on? At this point in Derek's video, he starts describing the pointing vector, and frankly that warmed my heart. I hadn't heard that phrase since college, and it was nice to see someone explaining it on YouTube. And Derek's explanation of the pointing vector is spot on. The pointing vector describes the flow of energy through the EM field, and in this circuit, points directly out of the battery and into the bulb. From this description, Derek concludes that the time for the bulb to turn on is 1 over c seconds if we use SI units. Essentially the time for the propagation of the energy in the EM field from the battery to the bulb. He even includes discussions with other physicists to back up this claim. Unfortunately, this is wrong for several reasons. I'll get to the physics reasons, and by that I mean the math reasons why this is wrong. But first, let's see if we can alter the parameters of this thought experiment in really minor ways to break this experiment in ways that violate inviolable axioms of the universe. If we can, then something is fundamentally wrong in this explanation. In Derek's explanation, and in most explanations elsewhere on YouTube, the presumption is that we can ignore the shorts that are a half light second away in either direction. Then we can treat the two parallel lines of wire as either a very big capacitor, in which case power flows across the gap in 10 to the minus 9 seconds, or we can treat the top wire like a giant antenna and the bottom wire like a giant receiver, in which case the power radiates across the gap in 10 to the minus 9 seconds. Or we can resort to talking about the B field in the top wire, establishing a mirror field in the bottom wire that pushes current along the wire to light up the bulb and that happens in 10 to the minus 9 seconds. Or we can simply trust the math of the pointing vector and conclude that the EM field is carrying the energy out of the battery and into the bulb across the gap in 10 to the minus 9 seconds. All of these explanations conclude the same thing. The bulb turns on more or less 10 to the minus 9 seconds after the switch is thrown. If that's the case, what's the function of the switch here? If the bulb doesn't care about the shorts on either end, why does it care about the switch? Can't I simply move the open switch far enough away that it's out of the causal bubble of the bulb? and the bulb will spontaneously turn on without anyone closing the switch. How far away does the switch have to be for that to happen? If it doesn't turn on until the switch is closed, can I put another switch a half light second away, and flipping that switch on and off would cause the bulb to turn on and off 10 to the minus 9 seconds after I flip it? Apparently, regardless of the fact that the causal connection between the switch and the bulb is a full half second. That violates causality and common sense. What's so special about the switch that turns an inert wire into an antenna? or into a capacitor, or establishes a B field. What if I put switches on both sides of the battery and the bulb? Does this still work? What if I leave the switch out entirely and just have two parallel wires? If that works, then does simply attaching two loose pieces of wire to a battery cause it to power every bulb in the universe? And what if I move the bulb to another location on the circuit? The pointing vector still points out of the battery and into the bulb, but now they're not aligned. In fact, what if I move the bulb so far that it's on the top wire now? Does the bulb turn on immediately when I close the switch? Now we're not invoking capacitance or B fields or antennae, so I can just get rid of this bottom wire? Can I power literally anything this way with an open wire if it's long enough? So why does this original setup confuse so many good physicists into making conclusions that violate causality and common sense? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Jackson e &M is a painful class, and the primary cause of that pain is that up until then, physics students discuss electrical fields and circuits in the static sense. That is, all of the E and B fields already exist in a working circuit. With Jackson, now we're dealing with electrodynamics. And this thought experiment is an electrodynamics problem, not an electrostatics problem. There are moving charges in this problem that were stationary before the switch was closed. That's the source of the confusion. Let's take the antenna explanation. What causes an antenna to radiate power? Current. And what would cause current to flow in this circuit? 
A voltage difference on either end of the battery would do it. Switch or no switch, a potential difference in the EM field must propagate along the entire circuit at roughly the speed of light. At least less than that, but for this video it's fine to say it's the speed of light. If there's a break anywhere in this circuit, there will be no potential difference and current will not flow. If there's no current, there's no power radiating from the top wire. How about the capacitor explanation? It's the same problem. If there's no current on one end of the capacitor, there's no current on the other end either. How about B fields? Well, those are established by the E field, and the E field gets its direction from the current flow. No current, no E field, so no B field, so no mirror field. In fact, one thing that Derek fails to mention was that the reason the pointing vector points out of the battery is because the E field points in the opposite direction inside the battery. Why does it do that? Because of the potential difference. What establishes that potential difference inside the battery? The current does. Why is there a current? Because there's a potential difference along the circuit. There's no way around this problem that the energy only flows out of the battery once there is a current. And there can only be a current once the EM field is established along the entire circuit, so roughly two seconds after the switch is closed. Now let's get to the mathy explanation. Going back to the pointing vector, this formula does not tell you the time rate of change of the energy of the battery. This is the static field description of an already established EM field. So what is the time rate of change of the energy? Well let's look at pointing's theorem for that. If U is the EM field energy density, then the time rate of change of the energy density is given by the divergence of our usual pointing vector plus another term. Wait, what's this J here? That's the current density and comes from the motion of charges. In fact, this entire term, J dot E, is the electric power dissipated by the circuit. If J is zero, there's no power and the bulb doesn't turn on. There has to be a current flowing in the wire, and merely closing a switch doesn't cause current to flow. It seems that way in ordinary circuits we build on Earth because the EM field establishes itself essentially instantly. But if our circuit is astronomically large, that's going to take a noticeable amount of time, and the current won't flow until the EM field is fully established along the entire circuit. So what's the lesson we can take away from this? Well, if you're describing a dynamic system with an equation that doesn't have a T in it anywhere, you're going to have a bad time. And if you're trying to power a circuit without moving charges, or you're trying to suggest that the EM field moves the charges rather than them both acting mutually on each other, then you probably block Jackson ENM out of your memory, and I don't blame you. 